from uh, Chief Kirk Rose. And Chief Kirk Rose yeah. and Cass Reed also. Yeah. They were, you know, they reached faith. Well, good morning. We are fortunate to have with us today uh, John Walsh. John is a professor of global climate change for the University of Alaska Fairbanks and co-director of Alaska Center for Climate Assessment Policy. Uh, also, Richard Dorman. Richard is Alaska climate is, a, is an Alaska climate change specialist for the Alaska Center for Climate Change Assessment and Policy uh, at University of Alaska Fairbanks. Prior to joining ASEP and UAF, he was employed for 30 years at the National Weather Service. So, gentlemen, welcome, and the floor is yours. Okay. Thanks very much for having us. Thanks for the, the early morning turnout. Eight o'clock. Uh, we, we've entitled this uh, Alaska's Climate, What's Happening and Where It's Headed. Uh, the implication here is we're going to look at what, what's going on, try to explain it, and give you a, a preview of our, our best estimates of the future. Uh, and here is our, uh, our agenda. We'll start out with just a brief distinction between climate and weather. And Rick and I will be trading off as we go through these topics. Then we'll give a, uh, uh, maybe a two-minute primer on the climate system including the greenhouse effect and this Arctic amplification effect, which does bring Fairbanks front and center. Um, then we'll talk about the, uh, the changes that are ongoing and how they may play out into the future. And we'll get into topics like temperatures and extremes, sea ice, uh, spring river breakup, warm season and wildfires, and permafrost. We'll try to get through that agenda in half an hour and maybe want some time for questions and discussion. That'll turn it over to Rick. We'll, uh, okay. Well, uh, Teco, John, thanks for turning out uh, bright and early Monday morning. So, just want to start out uh, making sure we're all on the same uh, same uh, space here. Let me know um, if you sometime. Are you going to set up the uh, screen there? Could you mute that, please? Um, <laughs> Whoever's online, please mute your phone. Okay. Um, so just to make sure we all are clear on the on the distinction between weather and climate, sometimes this gets confused, um, especially in the media. So the weather is really just the instantaneous state of um, the atmosphere. What's what's the temperature right now? What's the precipitation rate right now? What's the wind speed right now? Um, in practice, we, we refer to things like the high temperature today as weather. Um, the forecast for tomorrow is as weather. Climate is nothing more than the statistics of weather. If you can make a statistic out of it, and it's a, it's a weather element, that's climate. So things like high temperature are, is really, a, that's a climate statistic, the high temperature today, because that's a statistic from a whole bunch of instantaneous readings. In practice, we don't really use it that way. Typically, we're thinking about statistics over time scales of at least weeks to months to seasons, years, decades, depending on your profession. Centuries, millennia would all fall into the climate. So. Um, in red here is just a couple of the of the, um, the typical quotes. So you, these you may have heard. You know, climate's uh, what you expect. Weather's what you get. Climate's what's in your closet. Weather's what you're going to wear today. Fairbanks a great place example for that. In the winter, uh, we uh, we have stuff in our closet for lots of weather, and uh, it might be a hundred degrees different than the uh, extreme that you're prepared for. If you're a sports fan, I kind of like the this one here. So uh, you may have heard of this guy, Babe Ruth. He's a great home run hitter. That's the that's the the long view of his career. But Babe didn't hit a home run every time at bat. He had a, a terrible night against the uh, Tigers there in July 1921. Uh, that's the weather part of the Babe's career. Climate is his whole career. Great home run hitter. You can do it. <laughs> Show what we have a technical problem. It's 
escape and go back in. Uh, what what'd you do? Um, I, I just clicked the mouse. Oh, oh okay. The screen, so I knew to okay. follow those directions. Sorry. I'm usually pretty good with arrows. But. <laughs> All right. So, um, so just as an overview, uh, when we talk about the, the climate, um, we're really talking about the full Earth system. So, so the, the weather out here today, the, the instantaneous state of the atmosphere when you walk out of this building is, is for our little piece of, of the world, the, the current state from the interaction of all of these different things, the atmosphere, of course, the water part of our environment, the frozen part of our environment, the, the biological part of the world is important player in what's happening with the instant state, taneous state of our atmosphere at when you walk out the door. Even the pedosphere, the soil part of our environment, all of these are part, all of them are related, all of them are complex, um, interrelated uh, aspects operating on time scales from seconds to millennia. And of course, all of this is powered by the sun. Everyone in this room is well aware of the difference between the weather now and in December, and a significant fraction of that difference is entirely due to um, difference in solar heating. Okay, so to set the stage for the attribution, we, we put in this slide on the greenhouse effect. You're probably familiar with the, the basic workings here, but in a nutshell, the sun's pouring in its solar radiation. The, uh, the Earth is sending energy back out towards space as infrared energy, but the atmosphere traps some of it. That's the uh, greenhouse effect. And the gases in the atmosphere that do the trapping are carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, and, and a few others. Uh, it turns out that that trapping effect and the fact that it, the, uh, the, the greenhouse gases send energy back down makes the Earth a warmer place by about 60 degrees. So we can be 60 degrees colder without the, uh, the greenhouse gases. So that, that's why we have the statement there that without the greenhouse gases, we would not be here. And we all know that uh, greenhouse gas concentrations are increasing, carbon dioxide and methane in particular, and that to a large extent is behind the warming that we'll be talking about. Here is the, the picture of the warming that's occurred over the last 60 years or so. That map there shows the temperature change since 1959. I guess most of us in the room have been around for that length of time. Some of us have been around that length of time. Yes. Dr. Walsh, could you go back to the previous slide? I'm sure. just wondering how thick these layers in the atmosphere are. Oh, yeah, that, good point. Uh, that, that's actually a little bit misleading the it way we've to layered be. it because carbon dioxide and methane are well mixed. They're all they're mixed fairly evenly throughout the atmosphere. You've got molecules uh, making up a small fraction of the atmosphere at, at all levels. So really, the, the, the orange should be mixed with the blue. We, we just separated it out for illustration there. I'm thinking in terms of scale with the overall size of the planet. And it strikes me our atmosphere is closer to this thickness than yeah. that thickness. Am I wrong in thinking that? No, you're right. This is mainly to sort of drive home the point about the greenhouse gas effect. But you're, you're right. The atmosphere is relatively thin. It's 10 kilometers. Earth's diameter is 4,000 kilometers. So, yeah. We're talking about a thin layer. Uh, and so it seems misleading to me. Yeah, okay, from that angle it is, yeah. So we, we, we can uh, give you. some thought to reformatting the picture there. But the, the message about the, the role of the greenhouse gases stays true though. And Correct. It does send us an extra dose of energy towards the surface. Um, and this is the, the warming pattern that's been observed over the last 60 years. The color bar there shows the warming. It's in degrees Celsius. If you want Fahrenheit, multiply by two roughly. And you can see how the Arctic, and that includes Alaska here, has warmed by more than the rest, most of the rest of the world. Our warming is up around two degrees C. Uh, that's the warming for the Arctic. And that warming, the, the reason why the high latitudes stand out in this so-called Arctic amplification is highlighted in that middle uh, pair of set of bullets there. We've had a decline of sea ice, a shorter snow season, increasing water vapor. 
they all tend to amplify that effect of the greenhouse gas warming. There's also an asymmetry between the poles. It turns out the Antarctic does not have as much warming, partly because it has not lost as much snow. The Antarctic uh, continent is an elevated ice sheet. And here is the, uh, so the tail of the tape, so to speak. This is the uh, global temperature. It goes back to 1880, so it gives you the longer picture. Uh, the scale there again is degrees C. It's a departure from the average for the, the period there. And you can see how the global temperature has risen by about one degree C. You just saw how the Arctic temperature since 1960 or so has gone up by two or three degrees C. Um, but th this temperature is really just part of the story. Uh, Rick introduced the, uh, the, the Arctic system at the start. There are a lot of other components in there. Besides rising temperature, we have other evidence of change in the system, sea levels rising, increasing precipitation, extreme events, heavy rainfall events are increasing in most parts of the world. Snow and ice are decreasing and plant and animal distributions are changing, especially marine mammals. So we've got evidence in the, the biological sphere as well as the, the physical sphere. So I think we uh, now transition to, oh, one more before we transition to Alaska in particular. One, one more piece of evidence on the attribution, of one, what I'd call the smoking gun of evidence from the science side. Um, we, we mentioned that carbon dioxide and the greenhouse effect are, are behind the warming. There are these climate models that have been run through the historical period, in this case back to 1880, and into the future, out to 2100. When they run these climate models, they prescribe the greenhouse gases. Historically, they prescribe them at the rate that the greenhouse gases have been observed to increase. That upper panel shows you a couple of lines there, which are the observed temperature record. The, uh, the black line in particular, there's a blue line on there, and there's that red line which are the observed temperatures year by year, is global, global average temperatures year by year. That range of orange is the range among global climate model simulations. There are about 30 of these global climate models that have been run in this type of experiment. And they, they vary among themselves, but you notice that envelope really tracks the observed record pretty closely when you prescribe the greenhouse gases as they've been observed. Uh, the deep red line in there is actually the average of all the models, and that's pretty close to the observed. The bottom panel shows what these models reproduce if you do not increase the greenhouse gases. Run the models for the same time frame, 1880 to the present, and that blue shaded area is the range of the model simulations for the the constant greenhouse gas world, the artificial world, that they don't increase. The, the heavy black line is the average of all the models, and there's no increase in temperature when you run the models in that mode. So what we've got here is a sort of a controlled experiment. To the extent that these climate models are real, they are giving us a reason for that observed temperature increase. And we'll show you some more model results later on to try and enhance the, the credibility of these models. They are one of the main tools in climate research, and they, they point the finger at these greenhouse gases for the that rise, especially over the last 40 or 50 years. How long have the greenhouse gases been measured? The, the direct measurements with the actual sensors have been out there since the 1950s. <coughs> Feeling the sensor on Mauna Loa went out in the 50s. But you can reconstruct longer records from gases that are trapped in ice cores and other other proxy measures. So there are reconstructions going back thousands and in fact hundreds of thousands of years. I understand that. Um, yeah. And that, that's where they come up with this pre-industrial concentration of 280 parts per million for carbon dioxide. We're now up around 415. We've almost increased by 50 percent since the the pre-industrial record. Uh, the pre-industrial 280 value. Okay, so now we'll turn to Alaska and Rick's the, the expert on Alaskan changes. Okay, so um, perhaps the part of the program that uh, you came to see. So um, what's happening uh, recently in and around Alaska? So um, 
some of the topics we'll I'll talk about here. Um, we understood that you wanted kind of the broader Alaska view, not just uh, Fairbanks. So that's what we've got here. So uh, summer and autumn sea ice declines, uh, early river ice breakup, of course, more frequent wildfire seasons. Um, ecological changes um, are widespread uh, across uh, our state. So here, this is similar to the, uh, the plot that uh, John talked about, but this is just for Alaska. Um, each dot is the average temperature inside that box, so it's the greater Alaska area. Uh, the green line is just the smoothed average. And uh, I call your attention to the, to the far uh, right-hand side of the plot, the most recent years, and, and you can see that um, uh, four of the last five years are the four of the five warmest years of record since 1900 uh, in our state. Um, in this in this uh, version since 1900, you can see that um, uh, started out gold rush era uh, was pretty cold. Uh, then a fairly flat line uh, in the smoothed average through uh, the middle part of the 20th century, and then starting in the 1970s, a uh, very dramatic, uh, very dramatic increase. And um, uh, that smooth green line you'll notice has increased about uh, two degrees Fahrenheit just since the 1970s, and that's uh, more than the change uh, from uh, the previous 70-odd years. If you like uh, numbers uh, from the um, our colleagues at the Alaska Climate Research Center at the Geophysical Institute, um, broken down by uh, location and season over the last 60 years, uh, a couple of, in, of themes here. Over most, not all, but most of the state, uh, the changes uh, over this 60-year uh, period are greatest during the uh, winter and spring and least uh, in the summer and fall, although um, fall is working hard to catch up now. Uh, but again, just over the, the, the base 60 years, biggest changes uh, on the, the first half uh, of the year. Um, the magnitude of these changes are really quite um, uh, quite phenomenal. Um, you know, look at those winter time temperature increases. Again, the three month average temperature, um, and it's not you know, Vera Utkiagovic gets all the press um, or gets a lot of press, but you know, King Salmon um, weather observation there has been at the Air Force Base the whole time. No change in location, 10 degree increase uh, in the winter time. Um, you know, some, many of these places are small communities, have not had dramatic uh, or any population changes, um, really quite, um, quite remarkable. Here's a <clears throat> goofy question. Um, the location of these measurement devices, are they typically in the urban center or are they spread out in, so when you say King Salmon, where is the temperature measurement device? Um, so all of these since 1949 would be at the airports. Okay, so the extent to which there's a change in the environment at the airport could potentially influence temperatures, more pavement, less pavement. It could potentially, those yes. Those kinds of things. Yes. And any hypothesis as far as why winter is showing the biggest temperature change versus the other season? Yeah, there's actually a physical reason for that. The, the greenhouse effect is, deals with this infrared radiation which competes with solar radiation and the, the climate driver is a climate driver. In winter, you don't have the solar radiation, so there's no competition for this greenhouse effect. So that, that's one reason why the, the warming stands out more in, in winter than in summer. Um, the other is that the prevalence of inversions means it's easier to warm up a thin layer near the ground without having the heat mix upwards. Um, so that, that tends to favor a stronger warming during the season with the, most, the highest inversion frequency, and that's winter. Uh, would snow cover also have that cooling effect? Because yeah. yeah, if you lose your snow cover or your sea ice, that, that could also affect, and certainly for the coastal stations, the sea ice loss is, is, is in the picture. Yeah. It, it looks like Cold Bay has lived up to its name. <laughs> It is. Um, you'll know. So, Cold Bay there in St. Paul have the smallest changes. Those, of course, are extremely ocean-dominated uh, climates. So, because of temperatures in water, 
of course, change much uh, more slowly than um, the land, um, really showing the effect of that maritime uh, climate. All right, so past 50 years, uh, most of us remember 1969. It's not that far away. Um, and this is just the regional um, uh, changes on the left-hand side temperatures. Um, again, this, so this is the annual uh, change. A uh, little different methodology than the, the previous one, and this is regional. And uh, really quite, um, again, quite remarkable. North Slope changing uh, the fastest, northern and western Alaska. Um, uh, almost as fast and then less as you move farther uh, southeast. Um, this is uh, really illustrating uh, changes to a significant extent in the frozen part of our world, sea ice decline and, um, and snow cover. Uh, we talk a lot about temperature in Alaska because that's what's changing the most, but one of the outcomes of the climate models is precipitation overall is expected to increase. And on the, uh, on the right-hand side there is, again, the 50-year change in uh, total annual precipitation. And uh, you get, uh, I colored uh, these regions, uh, if the change met that uh, strict statistical signif uh, statistically significant criteria. But the trends everywhere are up. And in some regions, including ours, uh, we're in the uh, southeast interior in the um, in NOAA's climate uh, regions, and a 10% increase for our region over the last uh, over the last 50 years. So really, uh, again, um, this is entirely consistent with um, the climate model expectation. So that would include rain and snow. This is this is a full year rain and the melted melted My water from snow. observation is that snowpack is less at least in the Fairbanks area. This is my observation, having lived here for the period in, in increased rain. Is that, have you broken that data out for rain and snow during that period? Um, we do have, we do have some, uh, some numbers on that. The, the Weather Bureau Weather Service has never um, recorded the amount of precipitation falling as rain versus snow. Um, there is snowfall, and luckily for us here in Fairbanks, we don't get many mixed rain and snow events. So it, we can we can practically do it. Place like Anchorage, that's a lot harder to do with more rain. But we'll be getting to snow here coming okay. up. Thank you. I have a question. I'm sorry to jump on in, but you made me think uh, CO2 and methane kind of get the rap as uh, greenhouse gases. But isn't water vapor the proportionally the greatest greenhouse gas? Yep, you're right. In terms of the number of watts per square meter coming down from greenhouse gases, water vapor is number one, the strongest greenhouse gas. In terms of the change, though, there has been less change in water vapor than there has been in carbon dioxide and methane. Um, there are, there are some signs that water vapor is increasing a little bit as temperatures warm, but fortunately, the CO2 and methane are increasing greater than the uh, water vapor. Right, exactly. But, uh, Another question, uh, 1800 seems to be kind of a point of reference, and if I'm remembering correctly, we were kind of coming on out of a mini ice age in about that era. Did the models go back, say, 2,000 years or something like that? There, there have been simulations, um, but that, that little ice age is tough to simulate. Um, a lot depends on how the modelers prescribe volcanic emissions, thinking as volcanoes may have played some role in the Little Ice Age. Um, but if you don't prescribe the volcanic emissions, it, it is tough to simulate that Little Ice Age. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one of the, the trickier problems in the, in the, the climate modeling world. Okay, so we will come back to the models in just a second here. But at one point about uh, this, this diagram on the left that pertains to the model, the average warming over the state is, is in the neighborhood of three or four degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we'll compare that to the model simulations next. That's two to three degrees C, if you want to put it in the, the numbers that the modelers use. And here is the uh, sort of a nutshell summary of climate model simulations into the future. So they're, they're not just stopping at the present year, they're going into the future. And one of the wild cards in these simulations of the future 
is what we are going to do, what humanity is going to do with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. So they, they have different scenarios of greenhouse gas emissions. These are called these RCPs, Representative Concentration Pathways. And they're numbered 8.5, 4.5, 2.6. 8.5 is more or less the business as usual. We don't do much to change the present emission trajectory. 2.6 is where we really get our act together, not only reduce emissions, but get them down to zero by about 2050. So that's an extreme mitigation scenario, an extremely challenging mitigation scenario. And down at the, uh, the bottom there, you have panels showing the global temperature under those three scenarios, the Arctic temperatures averaged over the year in the middle panel, and the Arctic temperatures on the right averaged over just the winter. And you see how the models do capture that greater warming in the winter that the, the historical record shows already is, is ongoing. The warming is, is, is a lot greater in that high emission scenario, as you might expect. It levels off in that extreme mitigation scenario, the 2.6. But you'll notice that for the Arctic, the middle panel shows that even under that extreme mitigation scenario, the warming is another three degrees C or so, which is about what we've already had. Uh, so we, we would essentially double that warming. Um, if we, you go by the high emission scenario, the business as usual, the warming is up around 10 degrees C, 18 degrees Fahrenheit, which is fairly sobering. Um, just for perspective here, the Paris Agreement, which we've backed out of, it set a target warming of two degrees C for the global temperature. The left panel is the global temperature projection, <coughs> and you'll see that only that extreme mitigation scenario meets the Paris Agreement target. The middle range scenario does not, and the business as usual scenario does not. Could you tell us what RCP is again? I, yeah, I it stands it. for Representative Concentration <coughs> Pathways. And they are sort of different ways the CO2 and methane concentrations and the aerosol concentrations might play out over the rest of a century, depending on what types of mitigation measures are, are put into place. Thanks. And then the number there, the 8.5, 4.5, and 2.6, is the number of additional watts per square meter that would be coming down to the surface under those different scenarios. Yeah, I'm sure. kind of curious. Uh, you know, we see what's happening in the Arctic. And of course, there are certain parameters that were tried to reduce the amount of carbon in the air. Now, what's happening as far as China and India? They are, I presume, the chief polluters in the, in the world. I know China is trying to get on LNG. Right. Uh, I, I don't know whether that's something you want to... Well, right. Air emissions are still going up at a pretty good rate. Yeah. I know China definitely is exceeding the U.S. in emissions. I think the U.S. may still be number one on a per capita basis. Huh. China has over a billion Yeah, people, they have so a they, lot more. total is, is greater than ours. And India. Yeah, uh, India is in that category as well. So Alaska's number one, isn't it? In terms per of capita. per capita, I think we are. No. Yeah. <laughs> but, but your air conditioner, Mike. Uh, I, I'd like to add something here that I think is often overlooked, uh, and I recently became aware of this, that something on the order of 90% of all mammals on this planet are human food animals. The, the rest of the wild animals are only about 10% of the whole mammals. And a great number of those mammals are ungulates, that produce methane. And nobody ever really puts their finger on human food as a, produ a producer of greenhouse gases. But it's an enormous factor. I mean, we essentially have engineered the planet to create our food to the degree that almost 90% of it is coming from ungulates that produce methane. And it's never really talked about as a factor in climate change. I don't hear it talked about, but it's our food that's as big a problem as anything. Good point. And that methane is a potent greenhouse gas. Yeah, it's cattle and sheep yeah. uh, primarily that are doing this with methane. 
something else that um, I recently read that uh, I was oblivious to on before is there are 60,000 ships that deliver containers, and everything comes by container. And uh, if you take the top 10, the largest 10 of those 60,000 ships produce more pollution than all the cars in the world mm -hmm. because they use bunker oil. Ships mm -hmm. at sea use bunker oil, and I don't see that in the conversation. Mm -hmm. There was a good point. Um, some of the largest container ships in the, in the world are starting, some of the companies are starting to ship to use natural gas. Uh, power their um, their ships because of the bunker oil and that much. More well, let's let's see the percentages. What difference it makes? <laughs> Got a long way to go for sure. There's sixty thousand of them. Too long. Yeah, agreed. Let me uh, ask a question. Uh, how are you doing? Working through your slides here. Are, are you about halfway through? Yeah, roughly half. Yeah. So uh, why don't we stick with the plan? We'll we'll let them go through their slides and then ask questions. Okay. I guess I didn't hear that because I was late, so I didn't hear your rules. Sorry. You just made them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we we'll move right along here then. Uh, just one one other point on these model projections uh, having to do with precipitation. Rick mentioned that precipitation is already increasing. Um, models are quite consistent in predicting increases in precipitation as part of climate change, at least in the high latitudes. Not necessarily true for the lower latitudes, but the, these diagrams show the percentage increase in precipitation that's predicted for the late century, 2071 to 2100. Uh, it's a percentage change under these two scenarios, the really low emission one and the business as usual one on the right. And the, the highest percentage increases are up in the, you know, up where we are. In fact, the percentage increase under the at 8.5 scenario in Alaska is over 30 percent. So that that's a non-trivial increase, and it, those are statistically significant increases. To some respects, there's uh, there's more robustness in the, the projections of precipitation than there is of temperature in, in, in some in some cases. Okay, so now we'll turn to sea ice, and, and Rick's the uh, been following that pretty closely over the last few years. Okay, so um, uh, sea ice, uh, of course, uh, we all know has been decreasing uh, very uh, substantially, uh, in not just around Alaska, but in the Arctic as a whole. Uh, on the left-hand side is just the plot. This is the headline number that uh, gets the, the news coverage, the September average extent. Uh, September is when Arctic sea ice reaches its uh, annual minimum uh, nowadays. Uh, back uh, prior to 1990, sometimes it was in August, but now it's in September. And you can see uh, a, an, an unsteady but fairly marked, very marked downward trend. Uh, the blue line there, um, in, so if that's just the estimated mean for where we're at, has decreased by, um, you know, only, only a little above half of the average uh, September ice extent than we had uh, back in the late 1970s. On the right hand side is the sea ice volume extent. Of course, it's just the two dimension, but the thickness of the ice matters greatly uh, to the climate system, to the biology of the Arctic. And uh, again, since 1979 from the Polar Science Center at the University of Washington, top line is the average April uh, thickness, and the bottom line is the average September thickness. That's the two, the two. Um, uh, annual extremes. Um, this is kind of interesting uh, to me. Um, you'll notice the trend, so it's just the thick black line there, um, is, is very similar in both, both the uh, winter maximum vo volume and the summer minimum volume um, in the September uh, volume. Um, now, of course, the September decline is much greater as a percent. Um, it's declined by more than 50% the total amount of ice left uh, in, uh, in September, the, the percentage change is not as great in the, uh, in the winter, but really a very substantial loss of the total volume of ice uh, over the last uh, 40 uh, years. Now closer to home, uh, this is really, um, uh, really quite remarkable. Um, the Chukchi Sea, so north of the Bering Strait, uh, on up to uh, Point Barrow and Points North is um, rapidly becoming what the Bering Sea has always been, and that's a seasonally 
ice covered sea or or put it another way a seasonally ice free sea um, nowadays uh, we are getting very close to the, uh, the daily uh, minimum extent is now not quite zero, but we're approaching that, as you can see there, the, the smooth, the average there, black line. And at this point, every September, there is no ice anywhere close to Alaska. It's now typically uh, hundreds of miles uh, to the north of Alaska. That, of course, is very different than it used to be, um, and some of you will remember the days when, when uh, the barges could not round Point Barrow to get to Prudhoe Bay. Those days are long gone. Uh, similarly, on the, in the Beaufort Sea, so east of Point Barrow, uh, very dramatic decline in, uh, the, in the annual uh, minimum. Uh, with, um, we've lost uh, more than a half of the ice extent now of the typical annual minimum than we had um, through 1990, notice that the smooth line there, basically flat um, through the 80s uh, and really started to drop off uh, after that. So um, near Alaska, the changes uh, even more dramatic than looking at the Arctic uh, as a whole. Freeze up is coming much later than it used to. Uh, this is uh, when both the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas become more than 95% uh, ice covered. Uh, and you can see that uh, since in the last 40 years, uh, both seas are now uh, effectively freezing over um, three to even four weeks later than they did uh, back in the 1980s. And very important uh, impacts to, to uh, the economy, uh, both local and on the, on the larger scale, things like uh, when the Chukchi is going to freeze over incredibly important in decisions for, uh, say, the Red Dog uh, mine folks. So um, really uh, very substantial changes, and, and these are ongoing. This is one of those uh, fantastic uh, jaw-dropping plots. Um, since 1850, Bering Sea, February ice extent. Um, Dr. Walsh here led uh, the effort to reconstruct uh, ice extent uh, to way back. Um, you might wonder how good ice extent could possibly be in the Bering Sea in the, uh, say, the 1870s, and the answer is much better than you might think. What was happening in the Bering Sea uh, starting about 1850? Whaling. And whalers kept, captains kept close track of where they were. Whalers, by definition, wanted to work near the ice edge. So while we don't have the daily resolution, of course, we have a pretty good idea of where the ice edge was through most of this period. And you can see both 2018 and 2019 are absolutely nothing like uh, any time in the past. Uh, not in your great, 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 great grandfather's day have we seen ice as low as we've seen the last two years in the Bering Sea. So what, what's actually behind that Bering Sea ice loss? I mean, Rick showed that places like Cold Bay, St. Paul, it's not warmed all that much in a degree or two, not much in terms of air temperature. It turns out the heat content in the ocean has gone up. That's a plot in the upper left there, the top panel Bering Sea plot, the far upper left. It's the water temperature in the Bering Sea uh, summed up through the, the water column. So it's the amount of... Uh, the amount of heat in the, in, the, in the ocean layer. That's been at unprecedented levels in the last couple of years. We carried out a study, um, I'll try to get through this quickly here so we, we're not late. We, we carried out a study of how likely that heat event is uh, in a world with and without anthropogenic global change, the greenhouse driven warming. Those distributions in the lower panel on the left are the pre-industrial simulations of how warm the water should be in the, in the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska without any increase of greenhouse gases. Those vertical lines are what we observed the last two years. The distributions on the right are what a greenhouse climate says our distribution should be in the present day. 
some years warmer than others, but you'll notice that the last couple of years are within that distribution. So it's not too surprising that we've seen water as warm as it has been in the last couple of years. And that warming of the water is always what seems to be playing a, a pretty big role in the, in the loss of bearing ice. And then turning to the future, uh, they, they've run these climate models to simulate uh, sea ice as well as air temperature. These are, this is a summary of the model simulations of ice. The gray portion there is, is fairly interesting. The, uh, the black line is the observed record of September sea ice extent. That shaded region in gray is the range of model simulations of the past as we, where we have data to verify it. And you'll notice the observed record is pretty much in the middle of what the models have simulated for the past. If you then carry the models into the future, you get into the colored part of the curves, the color part of the diagram. That business as usual scenario is the red and pink one with the, uh, the range and the average. You'll notice it essentially hits zero around mid-century. The upper line, the green one, is that mitigation scenario. And that's where the sea ice loss levels off, levels off in about 10 or 20 years. And it levels off not too far below where the last few years have actually been. So the, the message here is the future of the sea ice, at least in the Arctic and summertime, depends a lot on the emission scenario, the red line versus the green line. And switch now back to land. Rick can uh, take you through the breakup change. So I'm sure some of you have made these all for yourself, uh, buying your ice classic tickets and um, uh, 2019, of course, uh, by far the earliest uh, breakup of record. Uh, breakup now about a week earlier than it was through the middle of the of the 20th century. A week doesn't sound like much, but uh, if you look back uh, prior to 1970, uh, you put a week on either side of that line, you capture nearly all of the breakups. So a one-week change is very significant. And we're now at the point 2017 and 18, breakup occurred on May 1st. That seemed relatively late nowadays. And of course, uh, uh, back uh, the first half of the 20th century, that would have been a very early breakup. Not record early, but very early. And now we think of, ooh, May 1st, that's kind of late. Asked about snow. Um, so this is, this is not for Fairbanks, this is for Alaska as a whole. We have a, a fairly high resolution satellite drive data set uh, for the entire state um, since the late 1990s. And on the top is the uh, plot of the date when the half of Alaska becomes uh, snow covered, just yes or no snow. And on the bottom is the plot when half of Alaska becomes uh, snow free. And you can see that um, in the fall, uh, the trend is towards uh, later dates. Uh, in the, the um, spring, the trend is for uh, earlier uh, snow melt. Um, no surprise um, there. Uh, not inconsistent with uh, what we see in the interior. Warmer, warmer weather means uh, longer periods without freeze. And uh, so this is the change uh, since 1952. Uh, this is most of the long-term climate sites uh, in Alaska that uh, we have good enough data to do this for. And you can see the preponderance of uh, places are uh, increasing. So this is just the days between freezing temperatures. Um, free, growing season is very small scale dependent. The 30 and the 9 uh, there represent the airport and the uh, UAF Ag Farm, you know, only four miles apart. Uh, but um, you can see that uh, the trend is, is the positive trend uh, widespread, but not, not everywhere. Um, in particular, that area in southwest Alaska um, looks uh, spatially um, coherent. And here's the idea of um, uh, Rick Later at the UAF has done some work on, well, okay, in a, in a warming world, how does uh, a growing season or the day a number of days between freezing temperatures uh, change. And you can see that um, uh, here uh, for selected locations or regions, uh, everywhere has um, increasing uh, growing seasons and some places um, quite, um, quite dramatic, especially by um, 
well, really through through um, uh, either any of the submit emission scenarios that we've been talking about, the changes are very substantial over the um, over the historical period. Another satellite-derived product is um, a greenness. There's um, this um, NDVI, uh, which is just basically a proxy for um, plant growth uh, as derived from satellite. We have this back uh, to the early 1980s. And um, this is, um, so this is just the, the average of the last four years relative to the, the full, uh, full post-1982 record. And you can see uh, most most notably two things stand out. One, North Slope now much greener than it used to be. Much more uh, plant activity. We all know about the shrubbing of the Arctic. Um, the other area that stands out to my eye is in Southwest Alaska, where there's a lot of brown. Um, so less plant act, less plant growth at the maximum time of the season. What's going on there? Well, there's probably multiple things going on. One, the increasing number of midwinter uh, snow meltouts are exposing plants to winter cold. On some coastal areas, there's increasing uh, saltwater intrusion. So there's multiple things going on. Ultimately, though, what this is showing in Southwest Alaska, what's going on is, is not being plants are not being temperature controlled. Other things are impacting. Uh, that part of the world, as, as opposed to the North Slope, where the plants are responding very dramatically to the warming summers. Okay, so we'll head into the home stretch here. We've got about six more slides. We'll zip through those. We have some time for questions. Um, one interesting metric that comes out of these climate model simulations is the number of warm days in a year. I mean, we were talking about air conditioning a minute ago. Um, We've looked at the number of days a year when the, the high temperature gets to the upper 70s or higher. It's a day when it might be nice to have the air conditioner on. That upper left panel shows the historical frequency of those, those warm days around the state. And there aren't many of them. Less than five days per year, typically, fall into that category in the historical record. As you move into the future, uh, say left or right and, and towards the bottom in that diagram, you get a lot of these warm days. In fact, the Tanana Valley and the Yukon Flats get up around 60 of those days per year under the, uh, this is the, that business as usual scenario. And that, that's a major change in the, uh, in, in the summer climate. So we, uh, we, we should be factoring that into the, the possible scenarios for the, at least the late century. Uh, that has to do to some extent with the increasing wildfires. We're seeing more warm summer days and more dry periods. This is a plot of the acres burned per year in Alaska back to 1950. And uh, Rick has drawn in that line, which is the 90th percentile value. And that's the one that's trending upwards. It'll be interesting to see how this year plays out. The, uh, we may well be in red territory if we don't get rain in the next few weeks around here. Um, and one other, uh, metric from the, the climate models of the, sort of on the flip side of the warm summers is the number of cold days. This is a uh, simulation of the number of cold days per winter in Fairbanks, number of days with a mean temperature below minus 20. And you'll notice how they tail off. So there, there's, that's a positive side. If you don't like the really cold days, there would be fewer of those in the winter. The last topic we have here is permafrost. This is a figure from our permafrost uh, team up at UAF, Vlad Romanovsky, got sites that measure temperature in the ground up and down the Hall Road, those green squares on the, uh, the left map. The panels on the right show the yearly temperatures. And these are down at the, the deep levels, down at the 20 to 30 feet. So they're below where the seasonal cycle really impacts temperatures. North slope sites are the upper panel, the interior sites are the lower panel. Across the board, they show warming temperatures, but what, what I find sobering is the magnitude of the warming. Look at Dead Horse in that upper panel. Since the late 70s, the permafrost has warmed by about three degrees C. Uh, that's taken it up to about minus five degrees C. It doesn't take too many more 40 year periods to get that up to freezing. Warmed it 
by three degrees C in the, the last 40 years. Two more of those will take you above three degrees on the north slope. And it's saying that permafrost at a depth, and, and that's based on observational extrapolation. There's no problem in there. Um, these are examples of the thawing permafrost that you can see around town. I think the figure on the right is uh, the photo on the right is from Goldstream Road. East mm -hmm. side. Here's our last uh, graphic. Th this is the outlook for permafrost from that same group, permafrost uh, lab up at UAF. They, this is based on model simulations of permafrost temperatures, three time periods. So the recent past on the left, mid-century in the middle, and late century on the right, and a low emission scenario on the top, high emission scenario on the bottom. It's a nice graphic because blue is below freezing. Permafrost should be fine in that case. Red is above freezing. So permafrost uh, soil gets into the red, it, it's going to degrade. The uh, expansion of the red is pretty striking in that diagram under either scenario. And especially in the interior, where there's a lot more red, which would mean permafrost temperatures above freezing uh, compared to the present, which is over at the left, where most of the temperatures are below freezing. So here's our wrap up. Rick can take you through that one and we'll be done. So future for our state, um, the current trends are, are very likely to continue. At the very long time scale, century time scale, things like ecological changes. Um, if we start to replace boreal forest with more of a parklands type ecosystem, um, that's going to impact um, the fire regime. Minana Ice Classic, there's no point in going for January breakup date. At some point, the, the lack of sol uh, solar input, the solar constraints, are going to start to be a factor, but that's we're talking about the century type time scale. Um, the impacts to uh, to society and the ecosystems again strongly tied to changes in the frozen part of our world, and there's no reason to think that we're going to change the trajectory of those anytime in the short term. In the longer term, as John has pointed out, we do have significant uh, control over that. For some of these things, um, uh, the year-to-year -year variability in the climate is going to be larger than the than the change than the climate change, the long-term climate change signal for, through mid-century. For some things, it's not. For some things, we've already can't come out of that average variability. Right? The timing of the breakup of the Tananotany Nana has that, has now come out of that typical variability envelope and is now clearly. Uh, significantly earlier than it was. Um, same with um, same with sea ice. Uh, we, as you saw in the Bering Sea, we've far exceeded now um, the the envelope of typical variability. That's what we have for you. Cool. Well, let's go to questions. Is anyone measuring ocean salinity, and if so, is it changing, and what does it mean? Uh, there are measurements being made. In fact, UAF has a ship that measures things like that. Um, the, the changes in the bearing do not seem to be particularly large, large either way or even detectable. There are changes that seem to be showing up in the Arctic Ocean. In fact, that would include the northern Chukchi and the northern Beaufort. Uh, that's partly related to the melt of sea ice, the loss of sea ice. You're essentially putting fresh water on top of the uh, saltier water underneath. So there's a, a tendency for more fresh water at the surface and, and not much change deeper down. But there, so thermoclines are. You know, thermocline is becoming stronger in, in areas where the, the sea ice is, is, is fading away. Uh, most of the air data appears to have like a logarithmic trend to it, or exponent, I don't know. But uh, the sea ice and the um, snow and breakup, those seem to be more linear. Is that what mechanism? You know, they, they seem to be coupled, not necessarily one to one. So some of that is. Um, is a is simply an analysis um, based in part on the um, the length of the time series um, with only say 40 years of daily sea ice data um, there's not much point in trying something I mean you can do it but it's not it's not what we would call robust okay um, with the century scale 
um, data, then you can then we can apply more um, sophisticated techniques that um, are that are robust. So some of that is just a function of the data that we have. Some of it though is tr is going to be truly reflecting the the underlying physical changes. Um, you can always do the simple linear. Uh, trends if you want, but that may not be the best reflection, but you need those long time series to show that. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm out, out towards Esther on Gold, Gold Hill Road, um, been there since the 70s. Um, I always got 65 below every year. Um, now I barely see 40. Um, and uh, it's 400 feet to bedrock. Joe Thomas Sr.'s, Joe Thomas Sr drilled it in 1939. Uh, the top 170 feet uh, were frozen, the bottom 230 weren't, at least they used to be. Uh, Vladimir Romanovsky came out to my place a few years ago. My cabin, the supports it had sunk down in the permafrost, so what also had happened, and he thought it was, at that time, he thought this was not normal. He, well, it is normal. What is happening is the south side of the hills, uh, the permafrost is wasting under the AB horizon, mm -hmm. and and the, the less is flowing down and finding loose spots to to come up, and so besides my cabin sinking in, the the uh, I had a mud belt, you know, that covered 400 feet of my trail, and uh, and if you check the if you check the creeks uh, on the south side of the hills, you'll see that they are filling up with lust because I cross one to go to my place, and that's an astounding difference. So, is this a URL online? I'm sorry. Is this online? The would you show, would you the show presentation? It will be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Welcome to put it on Mike. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Mike. Yeah, just uh, uh, reading about whales on dying on the West Coast. Is that related to temperature or are there some other changes going on? Um, well, um, I, neither John or I are, are whale <laughs> biologists. Um, just from, I've read the same, same stories you have. There's clearly some food uh, issue here and we, we not just around Alaska, but most of the North Pacific um, has been warm, and we know that the even small changes in ocean temperatures impact the food web, starting with the algae and the krill and percolating up. So um, I don't know that anyone has has said yes, it is, but that would certainly be the smoking gun that the detectives would look first at. Might not be the answer, but that's the place to start. Okay. Yeah. You know, I've, I've been reading Nate Silver's uh, uh, book about signal to noise. And of course, everybody's saying, well, this, this, that, and everything. And the IPCC reports, in their initial projections were actually really conservative. And I didn't see exactly whose uh, models you were using there because they're trying to say there really is a problem. Um, and this has not been going on for decades, really. Uh, and I'm kind of wondering if, if you have a projection on what it will take actually for the socio-political to really take this seriously. Well, and, 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 and you know, and, and in all ways, many of us are parts of this. Um, and it's really, it's really difficult. But the consequences of not taking it really, really seriously are going to be really, really serious. The more we look, you look at those projections, you know. No. From doing nothing to doing something really, really uh, radical to change the projections. One of the challenges is that the, the, the reaction or the response socio-politically is, is only when something happens in your backyard. Mm, <laughs> when someone's right. impacted directly. That, that's when they, they, they start to make the connection. So one thing the science community is doing is trying to come up with these rapid attribution studies whenever there is a major weather or climate event that affects a lot of people and has a big economic impact. We're trying to get the message about attribution, how climate change made the event more likely or added to its severity. They're trying to get that message out quickly while the, while the event is fresh in people's minds, while the recovery is still going on in the hope that at least the, the, the message starts to get through more effectively than it has been. And, and you're right, but so far the, the message has not really sunk in at the, at the levels where decisions can be made that, that would have far-reaching impacts. Yeah, I've, I've always thought of it as climate disruption rather than change, which implies some sort of linear thing, because it's all kinds of stuff. Right. 
So I may have missed your definitions earlier on of mitigation, um, how you define that, and that's a international, I think. The one for Alaska, it wasn't mitigation. What was the word you described for the um, what affects the models on the high and the low, the A and the B1? Uh, it, it, well, they, they are different. Yeah. Different emission rates of. And those are based on something I'm interested. It might go and find that, and what you, how you define that. It's probably is it in your study somewhere? Um, well, it's those are actually from the IPCC. That okay. I just mentioned they they came up with these scenarios, and they they are called they are referred to as different levels <laughs> of mitigation. And that mitigation is one strategy to deal with climate change. The other is adaptation. But these these, these scenarios assume different mitigation strategies. Essentially. Understand. So you used a different word to describe early on, and you were in your slideshow than you did on the um, on the graph, the last one. It wasn't mitigation. You called that something else. Is that still based on the the international uh, climate definition, or is that some Alaskan definition? Just trying to. Trying to remember what word. I well, go back to that. Um, I'll grab it, grab you after. Okay. I'm, yeah, no, we can track it down. Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> I was just going to respond to Mike's question from my background. It's a new memo. Um, and fr but I've also mostly been catching up on what's going on with gray whales through the news as well. But there's a couple of things that could be a play there from what they're theorizing, and it's been designated an unusual mortality event by NOAA, so they're going to be they're looking at that more seriously. And in the late 90s, there was a similar but much smaller mortality event with gray whales. And it's two things, which is that the population has recovered to pre-whaling days, so there could be some carrying capacity issues that are coupled with climate change issues. And their dying now is likely related to insufficient food during last summer because they fast during migration. So when they migrate down to Baja and then return, and until they return, they're not feeding again. Um, there's also been fairly, I don't know numbers on it, but there have been quite a number of ice seals and other seals that have been coming up dead along the western and um, northern coast of Alaska recently. And some, I've seen um, and then Billy Adams up in his Yagdik recently had photos of a bearded seal that had some signs of disease. That was pretty unusual. So, anyway, there is something going on, and whether it's purely food related, which may be tied to climate because of the, you know, yeah, um, gray whales are, they, one of them, I guess they had like seasoned seagrass in their gut, which is pretty unusual. Uh, they tend to, they're bottom feeders, and so they may have been feeding on what they could, not what they need. The questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's kind of interesting what's going on now. Um, you know, with this global warming, um, and you see the weather patterns in the lower 48. I think what's causing a lot of the storms now is that cold air is coming down from the Arctic and it's hitting the warm air, and that's creating a lot of the climatic problems, you know, that they've had in the lower 48 as far as floods and tornadoes and stuff like that. And so, you know, what's, we're being affected by this, but I think the lower 48 is uh, feeling, you know, the effects also. Jumbo. Because we have a lot of PhDs in the room, I wonder if folks might ask around. I think one of the things that we're missing at this point is economic impact. Uh, economic impacts from failure to do something about a problem is a problem. Um, economic impacts of doing something about it. Um, and so I just wonder if everybody would ask around to see if there's uh, where we might, where I might start to look to find who would come to speak to us regarding those kinds of impacts. Bjorn Longberg came to Fairbanks so a decade ago and talked about some of these issues from a different perspective, internationally renowned, um, and, and actually didn't deny global warming, but talked about just looking at the facts of it. And, and his was an interesting discussion where he said, more people live when they're warm than die when, more people die from cold than die from warm. 
So he, he it was a very contrary argument. Uh, I recall it still a decade ago, and he looked at he said we should be looking at some of the economic implications, and he might go to beyond Roberts. So. Boy, I, that, that's the worst place you could possibly go. <laughs> that guy has no credibility at all. He is With such you, a maybe. phony. He is such a phony. Uh, where does he stand now? Nobody listens to him. Now. Really? Yeah. Okay, well, you maybe know, we can keep it in questions. We have any questions? <laughs> yeah, I my, my email your you're calling me. Line, but... <laughs> <laughs> Can I do what you're talking about with Gary on attribution? <laughs> you like him, um, how do you communicate that you're going to have wetter weather and more fires? Or, you know, that sometimes these things, that at least at first blush, are conflicting. How, how does, you know, what's the reality of that, I guess? I think the, as far as the weather goes, a lot of the increase in wetness is, is in the warm season when there'd be thunderstorms. So that means an increased frequency of lightning. In fact, there's increasing evidence that increased lightning strikes are, are, are part of the, these climate scenarios. Uh, and the other side of the coin there too is that when you warm things up, you evaporate more water, mm -hmm. evapotranspiration goes up. So the net balance, the net moisture balance could shift towards drying, even though you're putting more moisture into the ground from above. So there, there are a couple, Competing factors with the the first order one that you know wetter means less fires. Yeah, but, but it is an interesting problem. You know, this weekend is a great example of that. With, you know, I got over an inch of rain at my house Saturday night. Shovel Creek fire got effectively nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so if if the more moisture means more thunderstorms and twenty thousand strike days become, eh. The additional rain won't matter. Right. Yeah, I'm out by that Shovel Creek fire and saw that too. Um, you know, one of the nice and in this case terrifying things about science is it happens whether we believe it or not. Um, and in terms of, you know, some of these numbers are very small that you're talking. Some of these numbers are very small that you're talking about. Is the two degree Celsius change? Is the three degree Celsius change can start being catastrophic? Yet, you know, we have these huge fluctuations in, in you know, sometimes year to year. Why are such might be an explanation question. Why are such small global changes so significant on, on such a large scale um, when we're worrying about the degree and a half of Celsius change? Why is that such a huge impact as opposed to looking at a 10 degree Celsius change that might really serve um, devastating consequences? Well, I think part of it's uh, tied in with the extremes, changes in extremes. If you look at a distribution and shift it, the, the greatest percentage change in occurrences is in the extreme ends. They go up by the largest percentage part. And it's the extreme events that have the impacts. You know, a heat wave event might only happen once every four or five years, looking back at some of these European heat waves. They may get a killer heat wave once every four or five years, but if the frequency doubles in their killer heat waves, there's an impact there, even though the average temperature might have only changed by a degree or two over that four or five years or even a longer period. So, and then similarly with precipitation, that's the heavy rain events that seem to be increasing disproportionately relative to the increase in the average. And it's those heavy rain events that give you the floods. So I, I think the, the, the extreme end of the distribution is where the action is in terms of the urgency and the impacts. And that, that can get watered down or downplayed when all we communicate is a change in the global temperature of a couple of degrees. So it could be that extreme event that's a flood that destroys the crops in Kansas that doesn't allow those farmers to be able to uh, um, keep their livelihood going while the overall year to year to year to year to year change might not be so devastating to their crops, but it would be that one cycle that happens now every year as opposed to every five to ten years. Right. In fact, one of the one of the really increasing statistics is the number of billion dollar disasters mm -hmm. in the US that are related to weather and climate. They're they're increasing exponentially. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and let's get one last question in the back in the corner. Yes. Not Jumble. <laughs> not Jumble. <laughs> curious to hear, you know, when I came up once upon a time, um, the interior was often referred to as an Arctic desert. Right. And hearing how, you know, like talking about warmer and wetter, do you know what particular
predictions are as far as you know interior savannah or <laughs> you know do you know you know particularly if, if the worst case and nothing happens what's getting predicted as far as the interior so land? work done at uaf you know so central and especially eastern interior is now increasingly too hot for white spruce um we, whereas in the western interior is becoming more favorable uh, for for white spruce in, with the fire regime that we have and is expected this idea of we developed this alberta parkland which i'm not 100 percent sure but a much more open much less much less spruce uh populated forest um different return periods on fire uh would be would be in the realm because at this point we're almost too warm now for things to grow back the way they were. Okay, well, gentlemen, thank you. Obviously, uh, a subject of great interest shown by the turnout. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, anybody that wants to, welcome to stay and use this room and continue the discussion. So, see you next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that was pointed out to me. I, I, I didn't realize there was I just a meaningful public. No, no, no. no. I, I didn't realize that was very interesting. I think I think ladder was the permafrost the water in the permafrost melts. Initially, but you remember what slide? I saw it was the interior that was showing the.